Hello again, this is the Brussels Signal Studio. My name is Justin Stairs and you are watching our elections coverage special. We're here today to talk about the future of Europe. It's a technical subject, but nevertheless, crucially important. Is the European Union headed towards some kind of super state and is that what we want? Should we stay more or less where we are and say no to more federalization or should we in fact go back to a time when Europe was a cosy club of linked economies and nothing more. Connected with this subject of treaty change, you have EU enlargement. Is the EU headed towards a community of 35 member states? We're talking about the Balkans and Ukraine. Should they join as well? Is it the right time? We're here with some guests who know a lot more about this than I do. Let's hear from them. The European Union, as we know it, is about to disappear. Two visions are now fighting it out in the hopes of spearheading what comes next. The first plot involves building an enlarged EU with up to nine new member countries by the year 2030. Eight of these from the Western Balkans alongside ever more important Brussels ally, Ukraine. This proposal has been backed by both Council President Charles Michel and European Commission Head Ursula von der Leyen with it being seen as politically expedient within the European capital to advocate for the plan. Despite this, many delegations privately admit that there are serious risks of unbalancing the system since almost none of the countries meet all the requirements. As if this were not enough, Ukraine is at war and the accession process has never been before initiated with a country in an open conflict. The second project is the reform of the treaties. The proposal was approved in Strasbourg with a razor thin margin of 27 votes, which shows that the much sought after consensus is far from being achieved. This proposal seeks, among other things, to eliminate the right of veto of all member states, a safeguard that favors countries with more influence, such as France and Germany. Such a move would go some way to make a large EU more manageable with the bloc no longer having to get the approval of every member state. The proposal would also hand back the bloc's larger countries far more power at the expense of small member states. This plan also foresees Brussels adopting a host of competencies it did not previously possess, such as in the areas of defence, border control and education. This would mean the creation of a super state, a global government on a continental scale. Such a revolutionary development could scare away some states which are currently in favour of joining Europe. The danger appears to indicate the nature of a current debate raging within Brussels. Should the European Union prioritise enlargement or centralisation? Okay, here we are in the studio with our guests, who I will now introduce. We have Mark DeVos. He is co-CEO of the Itinera Institute and professor at Ghent University in Flanders, Belgium. Thank you for your time. And we have Rodrigo Bay Ballester, head of the Center of for European Studies at MCC Budapest. But first, we're going to go remote to Jacek Saryusz Wolski, who is a Polish MEP from the Law and Justice Party. And as Brussels Signal fan, fans will know, he's already been here in the studio. He is an expert in particular on our subject today, which is the future of Europe and treaty change. He uh, was a member of the panel of MEPs which looked at treaty change in the European Parliament. And uh, he is one of the few who actually questioned the process. The majority are in favour. Let's, Mr. Saryusz Wolski, the first question for you, and it comes from Mark DeVos, actually. We just had a little discussion before we started this, this chat, and it was regarding treaty change and the war. Uh, Ms., uh, Professor DeVos says that basically, given the war and the risks that Europe now faces, treaty change is likely to be put on the back burner. It's no longer going to be a priority. What do you think to that? Well, it should be put on the back burner for many other reasons. Uh, and the primary reason is that it is a, a misguided concept. 
EU does not need this sort of centralization, uh, building a super state, replacing a community of sovereign states, because there's no, no agreement uh, among people. The nations do not want it, and elites do want, want to, to, to procure it behind, behind them in, 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 a, in a silence. Uh, so it, it is not needed, not wished for, uh, besides the, the narrow political circles. So for that reason, it should not be proceed, uh, processed as it might be, because it has been voted by the parliament uh, and sent to the European Council, which can, by simple majority, convene a convention to work on the new treaty. This is the plan. Right. And, and what is your assessment of support? Obviously, we know about the parliament support in the in the council. Um, are we are they edging towards? Do they need unanimity or is this a majority issue? No, there must be unanimity, surely. At the end, yes. But to convene and to work on it, simple majority is sufficient. And uh, some time ago, two years or more, there were 13 countries who wrote a non-paper saying we don't want to open the treaties. But after those two years, there's only one country who says no. So the resistance of member states is weaker and weaker. It very much depends also on, on, on how, how the political scenes will look like in the member states. But uh, on the side of the parliament, uh, there is a majority in favor of a radical uh, change of, of, the, of the constitutional system. And in fact, liquidating union, we, as we know, uh, which is described in the treaty, uh, and creating something really very, very new and very, very centralistic and not at all federal. Right, and obviously eliminating the veto in almost all remaining areas. I know that's one of the main points. Now, obviously, playing devil's advocate here, one of the the proponents of treaty change, of federalization, of the creation of a European super state, they point to enlargement and they say, look, we're headed for a European Union of, uh, I don't know, 35 members possibly, and without some kind of treaty change, it just will be impossible to manage. What do people like you, opponents, say? Uh, it is a completely fake uh, narrative. Uh, I've gone through all the scientific empirical studies on that subject. There are a series of, of very serious uh, uh, empirical uh, texts who say that all the all the enlargements in the past uh, uh, until the last one uh, ra did not slow down the decision making process rather the opposite accelerated so it is not true that to 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 decide quicker and and and, and smoother uh, we need to 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 change the system uh, second logically if uh, union would be bigger uh, every single, even big member state, would be relatively uh, have would have smaller weight and would be less uh, capable of blocking things. Uh, and uh, finally, the the Himalayas of hypocrisy are that because among the thirty four uh, areas where the veto should be could be liquidated, they don't liquidate the veto on enlarging EU. Uh, which uh, clearly shows that it is not the real aim and goal to change the, 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 the power system in the EU. It is just a pretext. Okay, final question for you, uh, Mr. Saryusz Wolski. I mean, you mentioned when you started out that the people are not in favour of this change. Well, I mean, if we look at the history of the European Union, you could arg arguably say that the, the people have were not in favor of the European constitution, which was vetoed and then pushed through via the Lisbon Treaty. I mean, do, does the opinion of the people actually matter? Is this going to happen despite the will of the people? It is going to, to happen if, if they proceed and, and there's this mediatic and political and societal silence. They can do the same. Uh, French have modified their constitutions. They don't need referendum. The only referendum needed constitutionally is Ireland. And we know that uh, Ireland was forced to repeat the referendum to, 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 to finally accept the Lisbon Treaty. So the, 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 the concept is to do it uh, on, among the elites by parliamentary uh, process. And, and there, there is majority for that. 
for the moment, uh, but uh, it is not probably the, the last word which the nations of Europe, which risk to be deprived of their centuries old uh, statehoods, uh, would, would, would accept. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. I know that you're you traveling so from A to B. We'll let you go again. Many thanks for joining us. Uh, well, and please come back pleasure. to the Brussels. Please come back to the studio when you're, I know, as, when you're uh, next around. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, let's carry on with that debate, shall we? What is your opinion, Professor DeVos? I know that you've, uh, you've written a, a book, in fact, on, on this subject. Do you believe this is an inevitable process or will it be stopped? Look, the book's called Superpower Europe. Um, and describes the process of a kind of crypto federalization or centralization of power um, that happens through uh, decision making of uh, country leaders collaboratively doing it at EU level in the face of crisis. And for me, I'm, I'm pretty pragmatic about this. Huh? I think what really is going to make the difference is the amount of external pressure that the member states feel um, on the EU and the extent to which uh, they feel that the EU either needs to change institutionally or not to be operable. Eh? Um, so I don't see an immediate necessity to start spending political capital on rewriting treaties. Because for the moment, for the last few years, um, we have managed somehow uh, to find consensus sufficiently to proceed in all these challenges that we're facing collectively in Europe through the EU. Uh, whether it's the war in Ukraine or it's uh, the relationship with Russia or it's, um, uh, you know, the energy uh, shock that we had or, or it's COVID, in, right? uh, COVID, industrial strategy that we are now uh, seeking to develop, uh, strategic sectors for technology and industry that we've uh, earmarked already. So um, I think the, the political capital uh, probably should go first to making that work and to uh, mobilizing forces and particularly money and capital towards these projects. Um, and so I don't see, I don't see an immediate uh, need to change um, the, the institutional setup of the EU for everybody, unless the whole thing runs into the ground and comes at a standstill. And then you might have uh, to, to have an emergency uh, kind of uh, plan, which then would uh, require some changes uh, right. one way or the other. Right. But That's how majority voting happened in the first place at the Eurosclerosis of the 70s and 80s, right? That's right. That's, but it, look, in the, in, the, in the fullness of time, in the long run, the, the logic of the EU is, of course, that it is evolving from something that used to be put, uh, entirely intergovernmental, um, and therefore entirely by unanimity of all participants, towards something that is proto-federal in setup. Um, and that includes the role of the European Parliament that has become increasingly important. It includes the fact that uh, the, the Commission has become a very political entity, almost a government-like reality. Um, and at some point, if this momentum continues, you will have to do some institutional catching up mm. because it lacks transparency and eventually lacks legitimacy. Um, and so I see the need as a kind of, I'm a lawyer, so I see that need to kind of put that on the table. But because of all the outside pressures, pressures that we face collectively and that we try to address collectively through the EU, um, I don't think it's priority number one. Rodrigo, is it going to happen? I think so, yes. I, I rather disagree with you, Mr. DeVos, because I, 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 your, your reasoning is very, very clear, but I'm just afraid that not everyone is as pragmatic as you are in the European bubble. Uh, so what you say makes a lot of sense, but if there is something that was missing in the last five years and probably in the last 10 years, probably since Maastricht in the European Union is pragmatism. And I see a lot of messianism and I see fewer and fewer pragmatism. Uh, what you say makes a lot of sense, but I, th I, I thought exactly the same thing about the conference of the future of Europe. We were in the middle of the COVID. Um, Europe's economy was um, on the verge of collapsing. Uh, the EU had really other priorities. And still, because of the pressure of the European Parliament and some uh, really like, like hoax of federal, federalist or centralist hoax in the European Parliament, at the end, the Commission organized online, mostly online, this um, the, the Conference on the Future of Europe, which was a mockery. It was an absolute mockery. Uh, a lot of working groups were basically piloted from the institutions. Uh, and some of the MEPs that were heavily involved there were basically even trying to change the results, notably one green MEP. And... Uh, and at the end, they got away with it. They did it. They did it. And so I fully agree with you. There are 
10,000 other priorities and the reform of the treaty that can be very cumbersome, very slow. And even if uh, Mr. Serizvolsky just told us that from a legal point of view, you will only have one par one referendum in Ireland. Uh, first, Ireland has the reputation of blocking EU reforms one after the other. And normally when they block them, it's up to two years until they vote again. Second, I'm sure as well that some other countries will put um, a referendum, referenda on the table. And so it's going to be cumbersome. It's going to block the European Union for years. And by the way, the conference as such can also last years. So you're absolutely right. If I could get rid of it tomorrow, I will, uh, I will certainly do it. I'm just afraid that not everyone is as pragmatic as you in the parliament that's so despite all the evidence of common sense, it's going to happen. Well, I think what Rodrigo is saying, to summarize, is their ideologues around here. They're not, they're not pragmatical at all, and therefore they have their eye on the prize, and the prize is the EU super state. It doesn't really matter what else happens. I mean, is that, what do you, how do you respond? Look, I'm not an insider in the EU politics. Um, and from my perspective, that, that uh, conference on the future of Europe didn't bring a lot of results. Um, so yes, there will always be people who, who try to uh, reflect uh, on, on how should things evolve in an ideal world and what are our personal views of things. And that's, that's legitimate in its own right. I mean, that, that fuels debate, which is uh, sorely needed. Eh? Uh, debate that hopefully also can involve democracy at, at ma member state level. But um, I think that uh, the, you know, the, the cloud that we are under, I mean, think of the Macron speech a few uh, weeks ago, where he said, you know, uh, Europe is mortal. We have to watch ourselves. We have to, we have to become faster. We have to scale up on a number of things. We have to uh, generate more, more firepower in Europe on these priorities that we share. I think finding a way to do that, generating the money, spending the money wisely, not organizing a kind of uh, rat race of subsidies at the national level, trying to pool money at the EU level and, and target it towards common priorities which you need to identify. I think that is going to suck up the political energy. Mm. Um, and, and, uh, and at the end of the day, the you know uh, the European Union de facto is is the level of superpower politics in Europe, but in the world it's a very weak superpower, um, and uh, what happens around us in the world is going to decide what we are going to spend right, our political right. capital on. So that's why I say first and foremost it's about the trajectory of the war, um, and for instance what happens in the U.S. elections in November. Um, and then it's about, uh, you know, can we actually catch up a bit in, in these areas? There is a lot of uh, political capital that has been spent in the, in the recent Belgian presidency of the EU on competitiveness, the future of industry, the future of our market, which has been neglected and which we could leverage. Um, so it would surprise me if, if that were not uh, the number one uh, uh, priority, certainly I would say from the from the position of the council mm. and from the position of the new commission. Um, but of course, uh, you know, dynamics in European Parliament and so on, uh, they, they can they can generate their own momentum. I, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm cognizant of that. Now, uh, Professor DeVos mentioned that three letter word war. Um, and this is also connected with the enlargement debate the bringing in of Ukraine or not. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, and here, we, here we are talking about the future of Europe. I mean, and, and one of the main theses of uh, Professor DeVos is that the Europe reacts. It's not really pride. If we react, we kind of, we see what happens around us. To what extent will the war define the future of Europe? When it comes to enlargement, I think this is definitely, and I, I agree with you, Mr. DeVos, uh, this is the, the, the fact that turned a zombie policy back to life, that it, it brought it back to life. I mean, before the war, enlargement was dead, was dead. In the West, in Western Europe, nobody ever thought about enlargement. They were ready to keep the, the Western Balkans waiting for more decades. No one would have ever thought about Moldova, about Georgia, for example, even less about Ukraine. And so it was a game changer. The war was a game changer and it's true that it gave a geopolitical, um, let's say, reasoning to a policy that otherwise the, I would say like the average Dutch voter hates. Remember the referendum of 2016 in the Netherlands where basically <laughs> they blocked they blocked a trade agreement with Ukraine. Right. And so that totally uh, disappeared. Turn, turned the right. table. To right. Turn the table. And it's true that now it has to, we have a geopolitical reason to enlarge the European Union. Ukraine, of course, also the Balkans. Think about Georgia. I mean, uh, 
of course, it's a, it will be, if ever, a geopolitical decision. If at the end, the country that is occupied by by, by Russia, the way Ukraine is basically twenty percent of the Georgian uh, territory is occupied today by by Russia, and if this country joins, it will be, of course first and foremost for geopolitical reasons. And so the war is going to have an impact on enlargement for sure. Also, it's going to have a huge impact on the institutional debates, as you said, because uh, if we need a reform and if we if we are now going to think about new institutions or at least new mechanisms, of course, is with the view of integrating Ukraine, because Ukraine is not a small country. It will be the most destroyed, <coughs> sorry, the most destroyed. It will be also one of the largest with a very, very big population. And of course, it can be disruptive. And so that's why also a lot of people, sometimes even in good faith, and not only with centralist um, you know, like subconscious or conscient actually, would like to have a, a reform of the treaties. But just coming back to this idea of pragmatism, you, you mentioned Macron. Macron is a very good example of, of, of the European leader who basically pretends sometimes to be pragmatic, but is actually very messianic. Look at the speech of La Sorbonne that you just mentioned, his second speech of La Sorbonne. He insisted, on, there are two topics that for me make this speech totally useless. First is obsession with abortion, I mean, that to turn out to abortion into a European right in the Charter of, of, of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Whatever we think about abortion, the question is, do you think it's, it's among the 1,000 priorities of the European Union? No. The second is its obsession with the rule of law as well. Behind the narrative of the rule of law, which is, I think now, became evident after, after you know, like the, the way the, the Commission favored the new Polish government, by basically giving them all the money and mere promises, whereas actually with the former one, they were extremely tough and extremely picky. And also, when we hear now that uh, some countries, uh, notably Belgium, wants to launch Article 7, not launch, basically continue the Article 7 procedures against Hungary just because they are vetoing uh, the decisions on Ukraine. Basically, there's nothing to do with the rule of law. But so now we have the evidence of the rule of law. It's a political mechanism that is totally dividing the European Union. It's basically, it's, it's, it's killing its internal cohesion and still they double down on it. And as well, speaking about pragmatism, I really thought when the war sparked in 2022 that there was another policy on which the European Union will, that the European Union will water down in the name of pragmatism. It was the Green Deal. They doubled down again. So instead of watering down, they just made more of it until, you know, some uh, thousands of farmers were, were, were protesting. But from a geopolitical point of view, this Green Deal can be seen like a harakiri and they just continued. From a geopolitical mm. point of view, the mm. rule of law can be seen like a machine of division. They just doubled down against a country, Poland, that was basically receiving at the same time 2 million refugees. So again, uh, and Macron is very much part of this game. Sometimes he plays the good cop, some the pragmatic cop, sometimes he plays the, the, the messianic cop. But when you look at his record sheet, including on Europe, first he's a good talker, he's a diseur, as we say in French. He's not a faiseur, he doesn't do, he's not a doer. He's, a, he's, he's basically like a, uh, rather somebody who speaks. And at the end of the day, again, uh, in his own speech, he was contradicting his own philosophy. This is what I found uh, really, really striking. Mark, on, on the subject of enlargement and also what, uh, what Rodrigo has just mentioned, I mean, it, you, you could say, could you not, I ask you, uh, that the EU is in fact throwing its rule book out of the window. I mean, we want Ukraine in, we want the Balkans in for now, for political reasons. I remember a past enlargements, there were a whole series of economic criteria these countries had to meet. We don't hear much about mm -hmm. that anymore, mm -hmm. do we? Absolutely. And that's one of the cardinal points in my book, actually, is to understand that because the world has changed around us, that the nature and the purpose of EU membership has changed. It's no longer an inward looking exercise where we say, ah, oh, join the club. This is how we live together in Europe. It's more outward looking and say, how do we have to position ourselves as a power block geostrategically on the map? Uh, and so the logic is very much security and defense. And my prediction would be, the pragmatist again, my prediction would be that we are not going to call it membership, but it's going to be de facto partial membership, where we, we make very deep um, deals. But like we have already actually had a partial deal with Moldova on security and defense. And that's actually a first step towards membership. And it's perhaps in these in, in our times, the most important part of membership in the EU. Um, we've, we've created Macron's brainchild, uh, maybe messianic again, um, 
In 2022, we, we, we created the European political community, the purpose of which is to have a wider group of countries, which includes the UK, by the way, to share borders and share security and defense issues. So it might be that the easy way forward is not to say, let's speed up the traditional pathway towards EU membership, because if you do that the traditional way, it's not going to work at all because of the reasons that was explained. It's such, such a poor country. It's, it's in a complete mess, uh, democratically, institutionally. It's still in war. You, how could you actually enlarge with a country like that? You can't do that. So, and you can't wait either, because you have to actually bring them in, um, but for security purposes. Um, and so I think we're going to be looking de facto at uh, a kind of tiered approach towards membership, where the first tier is more an ad hoc deal negotiation that is, in fact, the foundation stone of future membership, which is security and defense issues and how that will evolve in the evolving complex mm, we're in. Okay. And that will happen pretty quickly. Uh, on top of all the additional war efforts and defense spending and so on. And you can look at it, that would, would be my suggestion, look at that as a partial de facto membership. And the rest, well, uh, of course, the Ukraine, will, if, if I were Ukraine, I would ov obviously also be advocating very strongly to be let in very, very quickly and so on. And it's going to be a very delicate balancing act for us to keep the momentum, the psychology right, to that we don't have a second Turkey. Uh, where, where we say we actually make a promise we can't keep. Right. And we won't keep, actually. Right. That this is a, a, a genuine promise about the genuine type of union that has that has a different priority than the one before, because that also ties into how important is rules, institutions, and, and, and the rule of law going to be, because that country is a liability in the rule of law. Once it's in and once it's out of the war, nobody really knows how stable um, as a democracy the U Ukraine really is. The, I mean, it, it's, it's basically fast-tracking its development through a war. Now, we don't know what the outcome eventually will be. So I think the primary logic is really not about full membership, but about security and defense and economic support towards reconstruction and seeing that as the first stepping stone towards an eventual membership. Now, I, I want to change the subject slightly and talk about leadership, still the future of Europe, because in, in the future, whichever way it goes, let's presume that we go to ever closer union and all that. Are we going to see a leader of Europe or not? I mean, at the moment, we have national leaders, don't we, really? We have President Macron, who is sort of one of the de facto leaders of Europe. And we have the Commission President, von der Leyen, who has taken on a very high-profile role. I'd like to ask your opinions as to whether there will ever emerge a true European leader here in Brussels, or is Brussels destined to be the sort of the technical implementing arm of politicians elsewhere across the continent? Rodrigo, what do you think? So uh, this is the Henry Kissinger question. No? <laughs> who should I call? Exactly. Yes. Who should I call? Yes. Well, if you want a very quick answer, it's not the president of the European Commission, certainly not. And I think that if one day you need a face, I would rather say it should be the president of the Council, of the European Council, and one that is very much backed by the consensus of his peers. So if I see a center of gravity within the European Union, especially in geopolitical times, it should be among heads of states and government, nowhere else, certainly not in the European Commission. Mrs. von der Leyen tried to do that, and by the way, not so successfully because the relations now with the European Council are not very good, especially with her colleague Charles Michel. Uh, why? Because she be, some people are saying say that she took a role that is absolutely beyond her mandate as well. And so I rather see, in order to have like a, a balance in the, among the institutions, I rather see a European Commission that is technical. Technical. This is what they do best, uh, like a mega secretary general as the president of the commission, and so that the weight of the political um, decisions is on the shoulders of their, the main shareholders of the European Union, which are the member states right. at their higher expression. Well, what about a democratic mandate, though? If, if there is a president of the council, I mean, should he or she actually have to go out and meet the people and canvass for votes? One of, one of the things that drives me slightly around the bend is, is that people here seem to think that they have a mandate, but they never 
Yeah. Oh, the, the, obviously, I'm not too, talking about the Parliament now, and the Commission and the Council, they don't also, meet. Also the Parliament. <laughs> they don't, well, they rarely meet the voters. I mean, yeah. so how can this problem be solved? This is the democratic deficit, obviously. Well, I, I think it's uh, the uh, European face representing the whole European Union. Just, just because of the distance, how can you meet millions of voters? It's impossible. Can you delegate that? Can this person delegate that to these 27 member states, uh, heads of state and government, sorry, they have the legitimacy, they know their countries, they can be, they, they can, they are actually much, much closer. We don't need to replace those 27 okay. heads of state. We just need a good chefard and we need a good spokesman for that. Okay. So Kissinger will still be without a phone number. Do you agree with Maybe that? We call Charles Michel. <laughs> <laughs> if he's not too busy. <laughs> no, I, I agree. And, and I, I think the, the Basically, the, the key takeaway of the past few years has been that the uh, European Commission has turned into a very political entity um, and that we've had a very pol geopolitical commission, as they uh, said it themselves. Right. Uh, and, and so, therefore, uh, Ms. van der Leyen was definitely one of the most influential uh, in terms of political figureheads, even in the history of the European Commission, right. comparable to Delors, but yes. not with a big proactive vision, but more in a defense uh, position, uh, simply because there was no alternative to that. And there's the, there's the only capacity is there. And all the traditional uh, purview uh, of, of the European Commission, trade, commerce, foreign investment, technology, relations in, in regarding energy became geopolitical issues overnight because of the way the world changed. So I don't think that is a sustainable way of functioning. I think this will have to evolve, brings us back to square one about institutional change. Mm. So, But pragmatically, again, I think the key question will be whether the, we will have the same person in charge of the European Commission again. Okay. I think that will be a key question mm -hmm. to see is there going to be a continuity of power and agenda somehow. Right, right, I think that is an right. important one. The second one is going to be who will replace Mr. Michel. Uh, will that be Mr. Draghi, for instance, uh, a name that is circulating? It's about personality. Yeah, it's about personality. The very first time, because of, we didn't used to have um, uh, a president of, of the council, the very first time there was a question whether Tony Blair should become it. Right, that and would it, have been fun. Yeah, and instead we got uh, the Belgian uh, ex-prime minister, Van mm. Rompuy, mm. who is a different uh, a political animal. And no, no offense, but maybe enough Belgium so far. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, well, look, at least Belgians, if you have to uh, keep, uh, you know, wildcats together uh, and you're looking for people who can manage all these differences. The compromise we're, we're, we're candidate. We're pretty trained at that. Uh, but but I, what I'm saying is that that the, the profile of the person, the nature of the beast mm -hmm. that right. you put in yeah. that position mm -hmm. is having a very big influence um, because we don't have a mature institutional setup. It's these type of things that really make the difference. Um, but in the short term, I, I, I do feel that we are looking also for political leadership from key membership states. Uh, member, uh, member states. We really need it. Uh, the the, the, the Franco-German axis is, has not been working very well, to, to put it mildly. There is definitely a shift towards the East, uh, where the interest and the priorities of yeah. the EU lie. Uh, we have a country like Poland that's definitely proactive, ambitious, and sizable as well. So I, I think it's it's the first question about political leadership in the European Union is can there be a, a small group of national leaders that together can somehow set a strategic course that they all believe in and then take the rest along. And the example that uh, you gave with um, Macron, I think is spot on. I think Macron is a great talker, but he hasn't succeeded in mobilizing people around him. And he's also changing opinion quite a bit uh, over time. You know, yes. he's changed his opinion on Russia and Ukraine, changed his opinion on NATO. Uh, and so can he be a reliable person? And you need a few of these big animals from the member states mm -hmm. to really say we, we believe in it and we believe in it in the higher interest, mm -hmm. not just in our national interest, but in the higher interest of the EU. We mentioned Jacques Delors. Jacques Delors, that was the same period of Margaret Thatcher, of uh, Helmut Kohl, of François Mitterrand, and those were significant post-World War II leaders who came together and did certain things. Um, and I don't see that around at the moment, but it, it may come soon. May come soon. Uh, Hope so. <laughs> well, at least I, 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 I What's agree. What's your opinion of Ursula, incidentally? Um, I don't wish uh, for a second term of, of Ursula von der Leyen. I think first she betrayed all the APP, all the centre-right voters that voted for, for her. I, think I have the impression that this, her coalition was, and her way of ruling was extremely unbalanced towards 
the left and the and the center. So uh, for me, she's somebody who was closer to Renew and the SND party than anything else. And also, I think it's somebody who uh, I don't like her messianic tone on almost everything. Uh, I think she likes totally pragmatism. And uh, to her defense, I would say that, of course, she has a very difficult mandate because no other president of the commission had to deal with crisis of the magnitude of the COVID or the war in Ukraine. But again, I don't think she is the right person in the right moment for the European Union. What do you think? Is she the right person? Second mandate? Look, I, I, I would hope that, uh, I'm, I'm not going to repeat what I said, but I hope we get more leadership from key member states. Because mm -hmm. if there's not that, then I think we we are close to the limit of what the European Commission can actually do. Um, you know, they also lack uh, budget, they lack capacity. I also think that the way that the, um, the 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 you know all the all the priorities for the Commission have evolved, that the whole setup of the Commission, the portfolios, and who does what, mm -hmm. needs a whole revamp. I think we need to redesign, actually. Uh, there's been talk about creating a commission for industry, creating a commission for defense, because now, because the way that Europe has to change and has different policies than before, the commission is not properly set up for it as well. And that contributes to the relative political power of the head of the commission, um, who, who is the only one that can tie everything together mm -hmm. when you don't have very clear portfolios of individual commissioners. Yeah, and this is centralizing yeah. the power. Yeah, yeah. So, I, 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 so I, I find it a secondary question. I would hope that the primary question is, can we reconfigure the commission to reflect the strategic priorities of the EU in the new era that we're in? And can we build a coalition of uh, willing uh, member states that are, you know, somewhere in the middle between missionary and pragmatic and actually can move things, can move the needle, can move the needle. Yeah, yeah and, okay. also, and also maybe just in, uh, something that Mr. DeVos already said, I think makes sense, is also to maybe accommodate the different appetites for European Union among the member states. So the multi-speed Europe, which is a debate that is older than the three of us around the room, here around the table, but still it's true that it exists already. Europe already has multi-speeds, different speeds, but the more we do it, maybe the better. I think, again, that might be the, because it's true that some countries are, have a strong appetite for centralist, centralism, European centralism, some do not at all. On the basis of the internal market, which should be like the laying foundation and the common denominator, can we indeed create 50 shades of Europe, including with something very interesting, you say this European political community that would basically add another layer and actually like, a, a, like a, yeah, another layer of European integration. I think it's worth asking the question. That's great. We're going to leave it there. That's all we've got time for. Professor DeVos, you're allowed to plug your book. It's coming out in the summer. That's right. And what is After the title? The summer, Superpower Europe. Superpower Europe. Do you have a book coming out, Rodrigo? No. Okay. Well, that, thank you for coming anyway. We appreciate <laughs> it. And many thanks for watching.